Hi, my name is David Rogers, and uh, really great to be at the Cat Hacking Village uh, to give this talk, uh, talking about our hacking rig. And um, yeah, let's let's get going. So, um, my name is um, David Rogers. I own a company called Copper Horse. Uh, we're based in the UK. Uh, my background is uh, in in semiconductors originally, and then in the mobile industry for the past twenty years. Uh, I, I'm heavily involved in a, a lot of um, security related topics. I'm the author of the UK's Code of Practice on IoT Security. Um, I chair the Mobile Industries uh, Fraud and Security Group globally. Um, I'm actually communicating to you from Google today, actually, uh, from a GSMA meeting. And uh, of course, I like cars uh, and I like cats as well. Uh, and I sometimes uh, drive cars uh, that are named after cats. Uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, really, really great to, to talk to you. And um, so how, how do we end up with, with the stuff that we're going to talk about here? Well, uh, so my company got involved in a consortium called Secure CAV, uh, which was looking at future connected and autonomous vehicle security. And uh, with a consortium uh, together with Siemens and a couple of universities, uh, looking at how we could, um, uh, at a hardware level, uh, detect security issues and also uh, then actually prevent them in some way uh, or report them and to explore what we could do around machine learning as well. Um, so extremely interesting project. Uh, it's led to a lot of work with uh, an organization called WITCH, which is kind of like uh, consumer reports uh, in the UK. Um, and also we, we, we uh, through the hacking community, we, we've, we've done some good work um, as a result of B size Cymru in Wales, um, we now uh, have a partnership with uh, Cardiff University. We've actually uh, sold uh, one of these rigs to them, and we're doing continued research uh, on this. So, um, our, our our project uh, was right in the middle of the pandemic, and um, our university partners were due to create some demonstrators, and we were um, due to do all of our security work. Uh, on those demonstrators and of course uh, the universities couldn't get into their facilities um, so we wanted to do some cool things around some of the tools that i'll show you later in the talk um, but we couldn't do it and we basically had to to build something up ourselves and so we went down this road we looked at what was out there and there's some great things uh using arduinos and using canvas hacks uh, canvas hats and um existing uh vehicle components uh, so that's the road that we went down and um, a couple of really cool projects where um, they're using data from simulators uh, from essentially from games. And uh, so we, we started to uh, build this up and we decided, well, actually, this is really, really good. It, and actually, wouldn't it be fantastic if we can build this into a real a real car, basically? So we're taking um, telemetry from multiple different simulators, multiple different games. Um, now there there are um, uh, academic simulators out there, so uh, probably people will have heard of uh, the Carla simulator. But the community of people who are supporting um, these kinds of simulators is actually uh, quite small. But the gaming community and the esports community is absolutely massive, and uh, the amount of cool stuff that's being created from hardware manufacturers through to um, sort of individual software developers is 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 absolutely amazing, and so. Uh, so one of the things that we, we decided to build in was, uh, was a motion uh, rig, which um, we got from uh, Doff Reality in Ukraine um, and has been absolutely amazing and, and really gives us a real realism of actually how to experience a vehicle being hacked. Um, so we have this um, uh, uh, three Doff uh, motion simulator, uh, which gives us uh, traction loss at the back there. So we see that motor number three there. Uh, so, you know, if you're slipping, especially if you're racing, um, it gives you that real immers immersion. Uh, and of course, if you uh, crash into a wall uh, without any brakes, um, you really feel it. Uh, so um, we're, we've been gradually sort of building this up alongside all of our security work um, uh, with this with this car network. But then with with all of this telemetry going to these different components that are doing different things. And we're gradually uh, uh, sort of building that up. Um, so uh, we we have a 
you know, very straightforward canvas with with some components on it. Um, so what else can we do? Well, obviously we could put things like um, sensors on there. Um, we can connect up um, other in-vehicle components. Um, at the time, uh, so it was we we were loaned some vehicles uh, to have a look at. Um, and we also, um, we because we were in the middle of a pandemic, um, we couldn't really access, uh, for example, scrapyards. They were all completely closed. Uh, so we started to go around down the road of looking at uh, other sort of third party components. And we actually ended up with uh, looking at some of the, the AOS head units that are quite cheap on, on Amazon and eBay and uh, found some, some horror stories in those things. Um, but um, we, 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 we were able to get them working. Um, when, when we were building up the, um, the network itself, um, obviously we needed to be able to take that, as I say, the telemetry from the simulators and then transmit that um, into, into the canvas. And we, were, we found a good way of doing that. Um, there's a, a really cool tool called SimHub um, that allows us to uh, do that more easily because some of the telemetry is uh, sent over UDP or some of it's done by memory scraping. And of course, the games community have, have done a lot of the hard work. So we chuck that into the motion rig and other components. But um, when we were looking at uh, uh, the, the head units, what we, what we were really interested in was head units that were connected to the CAN bus itself. And um, there's a lot of research to be done here. I don't think there's been a huge amount done so far. Uh, so you can see here that, that this is directly connected to our canvas and to our simulator. Uh, and this little red box that you can see on the right hand side there um, is this kind of canvas converter box. Uh, and a lot of these uh, Chinese uh, Android open source head units actually um, use use these boxes. And it seems there's a sort of, a sort of uh, proprietary serial protocol going to these things. And then they're have the sort of pre-selected CAN dictionaries that are selected by uh, choosing uh, individual apps that are pre-installed on these units. Uh, and these companies clearly all talk to each other because they all sort of co-support the different as the different manufacturers of these little boxes and these these CAN bus adapter units. And and these these uh, devices, these these head units, are designed to be put into legacy vehicles. So you can imagine the security risk, and we're looking at you know, what is on here, what versions of Android are on there. Uh, you know, we, we can see that they've actually managed to hack in the Play Store onto there. Um, they've got Google Maps, they've got um, Chrome browser. So the question is like, you know, does, does a Chrome browser auto update on a device like this? And to what extent is the user exposed to existing vulnerability and, uh, you know, what's the the differential um, between what's what's going to be patched and what's not and really is it possible to to cross into that canvas from a malicious android app that's on one of these legacy head units and it's something that we're exploring uh with cardiff university as well at the moment a very very interesting area of research i think um what we also decided to do was uh, to build in some functions to um, at least demonstrate to people what would happen if we disabled certain functions in the vehicle. Um, so, for example, um, we thought it'd be quite cool just to be able to cut off the brakes or to remove the clutch function uh, or the accelerator. Um, so pretty straightforward, just a hardware hack. And uh, you can see my sort of Heath, Heath Robinson wooden button with some nails in it at the top left there just to kind of prove it out. Um, and we built this um we built this box um uh, uh which um uh allows uh, somebody who's next to the rig so this this is actually a beat size london um to be able to disrupt the driving experience of of uh of the person in the car uh whether that's distracting them by d turning on the wipers or or uh, causing disruption to other drivers by um turning on hazards you know, this sort of low level functionality in vehicles um, can sometimes have a very big effect. Um, we have um, evolved that somewhat. Um, so we've added in uh, new functions. And uh, I'm so, as I learn, you know, what works and what doesn't work, uh, I'm sort of building that into the rig. So um, 
we have some at the moment we started out with logic g29 uh, pedals logitech g29 pedals and um, essentially wired all that in um, so that we can sort of turn them off at will and then turn on other functionality if it's supported in the simulator of course because it depends you know what game you're playing or what simulator you're using um, but it's but it's a really really useful tool uh, to actually see how drivers react and um, to, to really cause a lot of trouble to them so there's a sort of there's what you can actually do in a car so it's obviously you know it's not possible to reach some certain functions because of certain security that exists or some electromechanical thing so we need to kind of ground it in reality a little bit but it's still fun to explore the kind of what if scenarios um, uh, around these things but to come back to like the core reason that we built this stuff in the first place was was actually to look at some of the the types of hacks that are out there or that could happen and I always like to look at stuff that is actually going on right now and what what criminals are actually doing uh, something that we've done in the mobile phone world and uh, so so one of the the kind of criminal mods out there uh, is is around mileage correction uh, so you can kind of get these essentially man in the middle devices uh, that you can buy through um, on online sites uh, we could get these for about 300 euros for specific vehicles and um, we wanted to explore how they worked, what they're doing on the CAN bus, um, and how they operate without obviously having to put it in a real vehicle. Because in most countries, um, if these things are not outright illegal, uh, it, for example, in the UK, um, you would have to uh, declare that, that you had this thing in a vehicle. Uh, and obviously that's going to affect the resale value um, so it's it's not illegal to buy one um, but it would be illegal to essentially use one and not tell the new owner that you'd use one um, but of course uh, you know people are using these things there is obviously a market for them so the way that they work is um, that you uh, install this thing and then you flash the headlights four times and it switches the mode of the mileage corrector uh, and gives feedback to the user because it's behind the dashboard um, and it flashes the hazard lights uh, the number of times depending on what mode it is so you know you might get four flashes for a particular mode and what what you see is that it's not actually stopping the odometer it's slowing it down but it's slowing it down because it's kind of manipulating the um, the speedo uh, and essentially so um, it is clocking up the mileage more slowly so it's very subtle because uh, there, are, there are databases out there that um, you know log your mileage when you take your car to the garage and so on uh, and of course if, the, if, the, if that thing is static and um, that's going to be very very obvious very quickly that you've been tampering with the mileage um, so and particularly for sort of more modern classics that, that people want um, you know people want to have a look at these these databases and actually check that they've got the vehicle that they have got and it's not unusual to see this sort of slow down in the curve of mileage anyway because obviously for something like i say a 993 911 it's a modern classic people don't want to put a lot of miles on them um, and it might be very difficult to 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 see the usage of it uh, and, and the reason that people are putting these things in is is obviously to increase the resale value primarily um, uh, because if you can, I don't know, take the 911 example, if you can keep that thing under, you know, 100,000 miles, that's, that's, uh, it's going to get you a premium on the resale. So, um, so we were able to install this thing in our network, we're, and it's actually on our rig now, and we can actually operate that um uh, using the rig and actually while we're driving along in the simulator which is really really cool and it actually is just an example of stuff that not only can we demonstrate how it operates but we can actually monitor the can bus and see uh, what the can traffic is obviously we can reverse engineer the hardware as well um, but it's a, it's a very nice way of doing that and we could potentially do that with other components um, for particular vehicle types uh, and of course there are a lot of uh, tools that are out there um, so, uh, if you just take OBD2 dongles, for example, now some of them are, are completely uh, legitimate, um, but there's other sort of more nefarious uh, tracking devices and so on. 
um, usually they're, they're accessing the same data and then adding a bit so they might add some gps information and then send that over the mobile network um, but there's other more interesting uh, obd2 dongles um, one example that i was told about um, is for essentially uh, spoofing um, the ad blue check um, for for lorry drivers uh, so that um the, the the vehicle is fooled into thinking that it's that it's full of ad blue um and obviously ad blue is is, is extremely expensive um and uh, for, for particularly for trucks so uh, it, you can see how that market is created uh for those sorts of tools that exist so um we can use our rig to, to explore these kind of devices and what they do um to to, to a limited extent um so yeah uh th there's a lot of lot of potential um in this in this platform uh for exploring uh, different tools that are out there um but in in the project that we were looking at of course we were actually so siemens were actually looking at well how can we detect uh this kind of malicious traffic if you will or anomalous traffic on the network and then how can they secure it and uh, and they were looking at this at a chip level and there were some really, really interesting things um, done. Um, but uh, we, we were then going to actually look at how to, uh, how, how we could actually break their system if possible, or their proposed system. And, and that's what we went about doing. So, so in the process of doing all of this, um, because again, we were in the middle of a pandemic, um, we had to, uh, work out how to do all of this remotely on multiple sites basically in people's houses and um, so we, we ended up being forced into creating a system where you could remotely test from anywhere in the world um, uh, the the rig or the or the car um, or the setup uh, where, wherever it was placed and so I think that's kind of a, a, a useful thing and um, so we had a, a sort of camera setups we had a few switch bots for switching on the hardware remotely uh, where there were physical switches um, and we had a bunch of vms that were uh, doing things like fuzzing and so on and um, in in the cases where multiple tools were running um, we were able to um, set up some tools to to essentially uh, do ocr on what was on the screen and then auto type as to the next step so that we were eliminating uh, uh sort of issues where we might catch something during fuzzing or some kind of crash or something in the middle of the night and then have to wait before we could continue to, to the fuzzing we could actually automate that capture the crash and then do something about it so so really really cool and uh, i think there's some real potential in kind of working on that stuff in the future uh, for car manufacturers and and for for anyone else uh, really um so so yeah so this is the this is the rig as um as it stands and it was just kind of con continuing to be developed there um i've got some nice little bezel removers it looks a lot better actually when you're racing you know, your brain actually completely removes the the bezels there now, of course we could have gone for vr um but we've got real real components on there so we want to see the real data and how how those needles work and so on and and to be honest i'm, I'm a, a bigger fan of triple screens uh, from an esports perspective as well and, and obviously from an audience perspective it's nicer to kind of see this so so we get this sort of full full visual experience and um it really really is quite immersive uh you can see we've also got a stream deck on there as well um which is used for for button control and so on so as as we've um as we've developed the rig um we've we've you know i mentioned that we had the uh, logitech uh, g29 pedals and steering wheel which is pretty much a sort of gaming a gaming device it's not that expensive really um but i modified the pedals um to to allow for the switching off um but you know there's lots of things you can do and there's a lot of community hardware modifications as i said so actually the way that these work uh, essentially they're um they're potentiometers inside them and they're travel based they're not pressure based uh, but there are some modifications out there that kind of uh create a more realistic feel so almost to emulate like a load cell break 
Now, if I want to buy load cell brakes from, say, Fanatec or someone like that, that sort of real racing brakes, they're really, really expensive. But you can actually buy some quite cool mods that turn your stock G29 pedals. Um, they, they put a linear potentiometer into, into the pedal and, and then um, uh, have a much stiffer um, uh, load cell uh, style um, spring mechanism and everything. And it just just adds an extra layer of realism to it. I think ultimately we will actually swap out those for real load cell brakes, but for now it just just definitely enhances thing, things. Um, the same uh, for we've now kind of moved on from the G29 wheel itself um, and put in a, a direct drive a DD Pro Fanatec um, base and a full size rim, and you can see the the size different there difference there. And it really, really, again, enhances that realism and immersion, especially, and you know, you, what you want is for, for the person on that rig to actually believe that they're in a car. Because when things go wrong and when we start to do some of the sort of quasi cyber attacks on them or real cyber attacks, um, it, we want it to like be really, really re realistic. Um, so that, that's, that's really cool and um, works really well. Uh, something else we did with the, the pedals as well, um, there's uh, something called the Leo Bodnar uh, cable. So Leo Bodnar, a company based in uh, near to Silverstone in the UK, work with some motorsport companies, and uh, they can uh, the cable essentially uh, gives you a much better resolution. So it takes it from 256 bits uh, of resolution or eight bits of re resolution to 10 bits, which gives you essentially uh, 1,024 uh, bit smoothness to the original 256 bits. Uh, we've put things like seat belts on there. Uh, one of the recent mods I did was to put working lights because we had all that data from the telemetry. Um, and so I put um, a set of 12 volt relays in our hacking box and, uh, and, and put some just some motor bike lights that you, I think I got them for 20 quid on their Amazon and just mount them on the back. So when you put the indicators on or the running lights, whatever it actually is on the rig, and we can just keep adding that stuff. Uh, really, it's just what I kind of, whatever I'm, wherever our imagination goes. Uh, the one on the right that you can see there is, um, I see a rear view camera. So I mounted that over the rear view mirror, the virtual mirror in, in and this is a set of Corsa Competizione. So in, in modern GT3 cars, they actually have these screens in their in their cars so i just kind of repurposed this dodgy head unit to to, to put that in there um and, and the whole thing's actually transportable so i can put it in a ford transit van and i don't have to kind of take it apart or anything and uh, you can see the boss there uh, pumpkin uh, inspecting it as it's about to go uh, to 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 visit someone okay so um here here we have the the rig uh, as you've seen in the presentation uh we'll maybe see a little bit of the motion you can see the lights here we're, we're kind of braked at the moment and waiting uh for for me to drive um we um on on the rig itself actually we've we've kind of expanded this with more expensive equipment so we started out with logica logitech equipment so the g29 wheel and pedals um we still have the logitech pedals there although these are heavily modified now uh so we've um put a what's called a Leo Bodnar modification on there to increase the, the resolution of the pedals. Uh, and we've also put a load cell modification in there to make it more realistic. Of course, we could spend a lot of money and put a load cell pedals, set of load cell pedals in there. Um, but remember that we've actually modified the uh, pedals uh, so that we can actually remove brakes and, and clutch and accelerator. But we probably will expand that in the future. Uh, so we've got our head unit here which is connected over to the canvas, which I'll show you in a minute. And then this is um, our new um, wheel, which is a, a Fanatec wheel. Um, this is the DD Pro. And the reason that I've put this on here as well is it gives you a really, really realistic driving feel. So the feedback and the force that you get, uh, probably on the Logitech wheel, is probably up to maybe less than two Newton meters uh, of, of, of um, force. Um, in this, you're getting over eight newton meters, and you definitely feel this. Um, I do a lot of sim racing as well, and you, the the feel that you get of of the road is much greater. So this gives um, people a, a, a more realistic driving experience. 
Um, I've got a TH. 8A shifter on there, it's the first master. It's actually uh, quite a nice shifter, I like it. Um, we just put a custom gear knob on there. Um, and all of this is connected uh, to different software in the rig. Um, so uh, we have something called Sim Racing Studio, which comes with the motion uh, platform. Uh, and that's a really excellent piece of software. Uh, we also use Sim Hub for translating some of the telemetry, and we've got some nice scripts and uh, and software to go with that. Um, I I use a bunch of other tools as well, uh, some tools that we've written as well, and um, and uh, yeah, so we also have a handbrake here as well. Uh, the emergency stop button is for the motion rig because uh, it can get a bit crazy. If you ever ever use BeamNG, driving the car off the cliff is uh, somewhat of an experience. Uh, this is the stream deck here, uh, so uh, you can see here that we've got the different controls. This is for the truck. Um, this is a shortcut button I have here for, for doing a mileage correction. That's just going to flash the lights four times, um, but we can cycle through. We've got loads and loads of different, uh, different sim functions on here, and it's um, really nice to be able to, um, to, to, to use that. It's a very nice feature. Um, this other tool here is something called Sim Dashboard. Uh, this allows me to send the telemetry data into another kind of visual tool, um, which is very, very cheap. It's an Android client for it. It's really, really nice. Um, you can build your own dashboards. You can build other information as well. Uh, again, just touching the surface of that, but we can probably do um, a hell of a lot of things in the future. So, okay, so let's have a look um, at some of the equipment that we've got here. So I'll start off um, with the mileage corrector. Um, so that's the, that's the device that you get sent uh, when you buy it. And this is actually plugged into the back of the, of the instrument cluster here. You can see that, that we have another one here. Um, and um, so that would be hidden behind your dashboard. And obviously, if somebody was buying the car, they might not know about it, but you might want to take it out before you sold it as well. Um, we um, built uh, alongside the custom uh, hacking box for um, removing the, the, the accelerator and the brakes and so on. Um, we also um, have this uh, sort of custom box here. Um, so th this is the Arduino I was talking about with the canvas hat. Um, we've also um, got an OBD2 connector here, which is uh, useful for, for us for monitoring the CAN data. Um, if you want to, uh use any of the sort of tools um that you can buy out there for car stuff um we also have um this is just a relay board here uh, so we're just using the 12 volt relays uh, i did originally look at using mosfets um but the the lights that i've gotten here are just basically sort of third party motorcycle lights that i've repurposed for, for the rig and what they're expecting is actually an output from a relay not from, from a mosfet it would be wired differently these boards are really, really cheap and it's really straightforward to integrate. Um, so you can see we've got a selection of head units and things that we've bought. We'd be uh, looking at reverse engineering these things. Um, the, this is one that blew up on me, uh, blew up power supply as well. So what a lot of these come with when, when they have a canvas connection is a canvas decoder. And it's, it appears to us that um, there's some sort of proprietary uh, serial protocol going to these and then um, through software, through the sort of pre-installed apps that they've got on these things, um, they uh, you will select um, a decoder for a particular vehicle platform, um, and that will essentially have a sort of pre-programmed CAN dictionary to enable it to talk to the CAN bus. Um, and so somebody would just plug that into their car. And, and, and of course, um, I've seen lots of complaints about these things because, of course, they're not perfect. Um, what we're more interested in is things like pre-installed malware, um, what type of state these things are in, whether they're going to get software updates and so on. Um, so you can see this is one here, uh, it's just a, um, one of these head units and they often come with this kind of car menu um, and uh, different car settings and so on. Um, so in this case we can see uh, some of the data, so uh, this is actually will change, it's connected to our canvas here. Um, at the moment, we just paused. So yeah, very, very interesting. And we've, again, only touched the surface of some of this stuff, but it allows us to play around with that and, and see what kind of things we can do. So um, the last thing I'll show you here is actually um, some of the extra components. So I, I told you about the, the rear-facing camera. 
Um, but uh, interestingly, we've got a TPMS here, so tire pressure monitoring. So one of my sort of little future challenges will be to add the TPMS into the rig as well uh, and see how good or how bad these third party devices are. These are just the, the pressure caps. Okay, so uh, let's get on to the interesting part. So I would love to bring this rig to Las Vegas, um, but it's probably not going to be possible. Uh, so um, I'm going to show you some driving. Um, I also do uh, some drive alongs and stuff. Uh, so let's uh, let's get going. So this um, this simulator here is a uh, Euro Truck Simulator Two. Um, I'm actually in the middle of a delivery at the moment. Um, you'll see that um, I do a lot of sim racing and uh, stream that online. Uh, and that's with exactly the same rig uh, and with the motion and everything. Um, and uh, I'm just going to uh, drive along here. I'm just going to, I've got the motion turned off right now, but I'm just going to show you very quickly um, uh, how the mileage correction works. So you see that I've got the full beam light on here, um, driving along into the, the early morning. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to do the the four flashes, right? And what you'll see is the response back from the hazard lights as it switches modes. And you'll see, you'll see the uh, speedo do something as well. Uh, these things can be a bit flaky as well, so so it takes maybe a couple of times to actually activate um, and get it to go. It's <laughs> be the one time that we can't get it to go. So what I call David's rule of demos. The demos never work. There we go. So um, you can see it switch modes there. And you can see also the speedos drop down because what it's actually doing is causing the speedo uh, to misreport. I'm just going to move outwards there. You can see the, uh, the indicators. Uh, so hopefully it's going to switch modes again. Get it to change. There we go. So it's flashed twice. It's moving into a different mode. Um, and you can see there that it's flashing again. So um, that's how that works. If we move back, um, I'll just show you, if you just show the lights. Um, so on the rear of the vehicle, if I just show you how that, that that's, uh, so I'll put the hazard lights on now. And uh, obviously I can put the indicators on as well. So, um, so there we go. And um, what we can do now is uh, perhaps um, just pause for a second. Um, so uh, that's really, um, you know, the what bedroom. the rig's about. Um, but I just want to talk about this whole thing about the future security in cars. Um, so obviously we're demonstrating uh, using older vehicle equipment uh, and canvas hacks that, of course, we all know about. We all know that the canvas is not integrity protected and there's no authentication and so on. But it is quite nice. I mean, it functions as a thing. Um, but obviously um, there's a lot of work going on uh, in the standard space, uh, but also in the hardware security space uh, to actually uh, ensure future security in cars. But that's not going to um, make uh, threats go away. Threats are, are evolving and um, some really unusual things are happening. And just really like the mobile phone space where we've gone from just having uh, kind of m mobile phone calling and SMS capability, um, you, you know, all this extra functionality that you never expected to be in a car is in there. So you, all of the functions for uh, communicating outwards, and there are multiple SIMs and cars, um, need to be secured. And they're all coming from all these different vendors. So um, it's impossible for the OEMs to, to understand everything that they've got. Uh, and even for them, they're not really au fait about uh, things like hardware security and how to implement TEEs and, and, and trusted execution environment uh, type technology and how to how to properly implement secure boot and build all of this together into a coherent whole but the technology is moving so quickly um, that you know they're 
jumping into to launching automotive ethernet uh, on top of legacy technologies um, they're launching uh, v2x type stuff so but multiple new interfaces coming into vehicles and and it's going at pace so while we can bring a lot of our knowledge into into that domain and it, there is a lot of transference of knowledge um everything from uh the stuff on s bomb uh through to like as i say uh, hardware security um through to mobile security uh improvements and to protocol security so that is all coming together and and they can kind of stand on the shoulders of all of that work and benefit from it i still don't think there's a level of maturity in the automotive industry uh that is commensurate with the threat uh, and of course you know this is a uh, these are vehicles that are essentially uh, weapons and, and can kill people and um, it's a very very unusual uh, sort of moving IoT device so I still have a lot of concerns um, and I, I, I think that uh, you know the security research community has to has to really help these guys to understand um, they're still coming to terms with you know what what CVD is, what vulnerability disclosure is, and how to handle vulnerabilities um, uh, in multiple places. Uh, and there are some sensitive ones, so of the obvious one being a lot of the the car car key hacks. But ultimately, they they need the security research community, and they will benefit from our input. Um, and I think it's just a case of kind of waiting for them to get to that state, and they are getting there. Uh, and helping to point out to them uh, the stuff that we see um, that maybe they're not going to see in the development center and they're not going to think, well, or they may think, you know, why would you ever try this particular attack? No one would ever do that when actually we know that, of course, somebody would do that. So we bring a kind of hugely different skill set um, to, to what they have in engineering, um, but both are equally valid. So. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical as to like how uh, um, uh, sort of attacks can be really detected in future vehicles on board, um, because as an attacker, I probably am going to want to disrupt that, and I'm probably going to know that 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 there's going to be some detection mechanism in there. So we really need to think like, well, one step or two steps ahead. So like how does the attacker react to a particular defense mechanism? Um, so in the case of the, the mileage correction there, um, we were able to actually kind of attack the defense mechanism and really, really screw around with it. And, um, you know, that for the defender, they have to make sure that everything's right. But as an attacker, I can just make sure that everything just dies uh, and they still, uh, you know, reach my objectives. So um, I mentioned sim racing. So uh, I really, really uh, got engaged with sim racing during the pandemic and um, and actually utilizing this rig. And it's been a really good way of actually um, talking to people who are in the car industry as well about um, the sort of threats and so on. And um, I compete in the Apex Online Racing, a set of course of competition, GT3 leagues and, and other leagues. And uh, uh, they're really, they're really, really fantastic. And um, uh, I think the more people in the hacking community that get into sim racing, it uh, would be absolutely fantastic. Um, but in a kind of another vein here, so I'm racing with the rig, but it's absolutely incredible to see that sort of line between uh, real world racing and sim sports uh, being crossed. Uh, so there's this sort of real mixed reality that's going on. And that's what we'll see in the future. It's really a gateway into the future. All of these circuits are laser mapped. Uh, the equipment, the Fanatec wheels, for example, they're in the actual cars. Uh, so there's this real, real mix. And of course, um, even these esports communities uh, suffer cybersecurity issues. And um, there's been a lot of DDoSing uh, of, of servers. And it, the suspicion is it's actually uh, gambling syndicates um, uh, sort of um, betting on races and disrupting them. So uh, really, really interesting in itself. Um, if you want to find out a little bit more, um, well, of course, um, uh, so you can go to my Twitch and uh, I've got a few uh, live streams where we do drive alongs in, in trucks. That's Euro Truck Simulator 2 there. Um, and we do 
uh, different things in the simulator and we go around the rig and explain what we're doing so so have a look on there and uh, there's quite a few more videos for for defcon here for this event um and that's really it so uh thank you uh, very much for listening um i'm going to be in the room uh, uh so for those of you who are in the car hacking village uh listening to this uh have a look around for me because i'll be standing there somewhere thank you